Spirit, God's Incredible Grace, Part 2. Last week, I spent some considerable time showing that verse 31, of, we're in chapter 24 of Matthew, showing that verse 31 applied to the ingathering of the Jews into Jerusalem and Israel. I did that to show the importance of comparing Scripture with Scripture. When determining what any given passage says, we need to compare Scripture with Scripture. And doing that, we re need to remember that all Scripture, all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And uh, that's in 2 Timothy 3.16. We don't use one Scripture to trump another so that we can re arrive at whatever teaching seems right to us. All scriptures are true. Therefore, they do not contradict one another. If we have contradictions in the scriptures, it's because we don't really understand one or the other of the scriptures. Okay, I'm going to read 31 again. If I can find it. Uh, and this is right after his visible uh, coming, return to the earth. And he will send the angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So from the north, south, east, west. He's going to gather uh, his people. And this is, remember we just said, this is after his visible return to the earth. Let's look at the implications of this verse. If this verse speaks of the rapture of the church, which many people teach. What do we know occurs when we're raptured? when we're trained, changed, translated. Well, we know from Corinthians, the 15th chapter, that we become immortal beings. We are changed. This uh, corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortal. So if this verse, if the 31st chapter of the 20, 31st verse of the 24th chapter there is talking about the rapture of the church, then... Uh, all believers are immortal at this point. We can't have a kingdom. Not the way it's described in hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Old Testament. If all believers are immortal. Because the passages, those passages teach us that during this kingdom period of 1,000 years, people are mortal. They die they give birth. The population explodes on the planet, according to the scriptures, during this period of time. Uh, hundreds of kingdom verses cannot be true if this verse is talking about uh, the rapture of the saints. But if this passage speaks of the ingathering of the Jews at the beginning of the kingdom, Comparing scripture with scripture, there are no problems with the verse. The integrity of the rapture verses remains intact. The integrity of the kingdom verses remains intact. We can read them all and interpret them all in their usual meaning. There are no contradictions. Now, if we want to make that, verse 31, a rapture verse, uh, we can also make it all work by saying it's speaking spiritually. It's not to be understood literally. Either this passage or the uh, kingdom passages. We can make it work that way. I'm uncomfortable with that. I am sold on the notion that scripture needs to be interpreted in normal way like we interpret any other any other readings or writings like we uh, interpret each other's conversation
Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, be with us today as we look into these scriptures. Uh, you put them here for a reason. You put them here for us to look at. And Lord, we want to honor you by, by getting out of this what you would have us. And we want to extend love and grace to one another as we agree and, and disagree with one another over some of these passages. Lord, your church loves you. Your church needs you. And we want to be filled with your Holy Spirit so that we can all come to a place of uh, unity, uh, even amongst our differences. Lord, we want to honor you. We pray this in your holy name, for your glory, for our good. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Where in the world did Martin Luther ever get the crazy notion that salvation was by grace alone through faith, not of works? Where did he get that? He read the Bible. How did he interpret that Bible? Literally. He interpreted the, that passage literally. That's how he got there. How did he uh, arrive at the notion that uh, we are all priests? How did he interpret those scriptures? Because it says we are, we are priests. He interpreted it literally. Now, those words were always there. How come everyone wasn't teaching that salvation was by grace through faith alone and not of works? How come everyone wasn't teaching? They had a tradition, and they were not interpreting those scriptures literally. They were interpreting them figuratively. Uh, they were ter interpreting them all different kinds of ways. Now, Martin Luther wasn't the first guy to show up with that teaching. Uh, that's, of course, the absolute teaching that the uh, early church had. That's the teaching the church had when Paul said, now listen, if someone comes to you and preaches a message different than the one I just gave you, let him be accursed. Also, we find... Down through the history, uh, down through the history of the early church, that there were a number of people that kept stumbling onto this because it says it literally, and so all at once they would go, "Wow, you know what this says?" And those people were generally condemned as heretics, and many of them killed throughout the early church history uh, because the church, the uh, Not the true church, not, the ch not that church that was, that was made up of believers in God throughout all the world, but the organizational church at that time, uh, that was a very threatening message to them. They had all kinds of power. They were making lots of money, uh, selling indulgences. Where do you come up with that? You don't come up with that by any literal reading of Scripture. Here's where I'm getting with. Here's where I'm going with that. If Martin Luther had applied that same literal method, method of interpretation to the study of the end times, Lutheran teaching on this subject would be very much the same as I'm teaching you today. This is where you, this is where you arrive when you interpret literally as many of the verses as we can. When you compare scripture, when you, com when you interpret literally and you compare scripture with scripture, uh, this is where you arrive, the teaching that uh, we're going to give you today. Uh, well, we'll just go on. Let's get started on Matthew 24 then. We've uh, done 31. Now we're going to go and we're going to read 32 and 33. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. 
as soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. When you see all these things, what things? What was Christ talking about all along here? When you see all these things, he was talking about signs. Signs that his coming was near. And he said, uh, we're not going to go into these. We've already dealt with it. But he said, when you, when you see these things occurring, wars, uh, earthquakes, famine, all this stuff, when you see this occurring in increasing frequency and in increasing t intensity, look up. You know, salvation is near. It's coming near. There's also a possibly another uh, parable or teaching to be found there in uh, verse uh, 32. Israel in the Old Testament is, is uh, sometimes represented by a fig tree. And Christ is saying, when you see this fig tree beginning to put forth its leaves, uh, the fig tree, if if we can apply this passage like that, the fig tree, Israel, began to put it forth its branches and leaves in the 1800s during the uh, Zionist movement when people began to move back into the, and when Jews began to try to move back into that area. And of course in 1948, Israel became a nation. Uh, the um, fig tree is beginning to bloom. Israel itself is a sign. Let me go back just a little bit. Why? What were some of the things going on at the time of Martin Luther? This is what, in the 1300s? I can't remember my church history that well. I think it's 1300s. Uh, what were some of the things, what did the world look like back then that Martin Luther did not feel the right to interpret these end times passages literally. Well, number one, there wasn't an Israel. Number, there, in fact, there hadn't been an Israel for 1,250 years. 1,000. 200 plus years there had not been a trace of the nation of Israel. Martin Luther, like others before him, believed that this is the word of God. And yet, if he were to take those passages literally, there would have to be a nation of Israel there at the end of history. And he would look out there, there's no trace of the nation of Israel on the planet. But now Israel is putting forth its uh, branches, beginning to leaf out. We have a nation of Israel. Does that mean he couldn't have interpreted that? Uh, literally, of course he could. As a matter of fact, we do find out that there were people, very small minority, but there have been people all along that said, you know what? Israel has to become a nation. You know what? Uh, the Puritan preacher, Increase Mather and Cotton Mather, Puritan preachers, back in the, what, 16s? Early 17s, I don't know when they were, in the 1600s. He said, Israel has to become a nation. Russia has to become a world power. Where does he get that stuff? Well, interpreting literally. It gets you to these places. Um, interpreting figuratively, it gets you to wherever you want to go. It, it does. If I, if, you want to, if I want to teach something that I'm not finding here literally, I can... Uh, I can spiritualized passages 
and get to where I want to go. Uh, let's look at, uh, we read 32 and 33. Let's look at verse 34. I tell you the truth. This is still Jesus talking. This generation will certainly not pass away until all of these things have happened. What generation? The people standing there? Well, they'd be over 2,000 years old now. I don't think he's talking about them. What generation? This generation. That is, the generation that sees these signs. The generation that sees the increase in frequency and intensity of the signs that Christ and others throughout the scripture predicted would be evident when we got near the time of his return. Verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You know, I've heard that verse quoted so many times, but I've never heard it quoted as meaning, as giving uh, strength and power to the notions that there will be signs. In this passage, Christ has been talking about signs that will be evident as we approach the end of this age. And he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Verse 36. No one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Only the Father knows when this return is going to take place. Uh, you know you're dealing with someone who is self-deceived, someone who is way out of line, if they start dating when Christ is going to return to the earth. It's just not known. Verses 37 through 39. As it was in the days of Noah, listen carefully. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In uh, Luke 17, verses 28 and 29, uh, this is a parallel passage to this, and he adds one more little story. He talks about the, uh, the fellow named Lot. Lot, as you can, if you remember, uh, lived in towns in a town called uh, Sodom. And that area was going to be judged by God. And angels went to that town and carried Lot out of it before the, uh, before the judgment fell upon that town. Let's read 40 and 41 then. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Kind of a nice pastoral scene here. Comparing Scripture with Scripture, I believe these verses, 40 and 41, teach that like Noah... And like Lot, like the one man in the field and the one woman grinding at the mill, will be removed from judgment before it happens. The, uh, the ones left, however, they will endure the judgment. I want to compare these verses we just read about uh, Noah and uh, what Christ said 
earlier in this same chapter in verses uh, 20, 21 when he's talking about uh, when he's talking about the, the uh, second coming, visible second coming of Christ to earth, he says for then there will be great distress, uh, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And this is just prior to the visible coming of Christ to earth. Does that sound like the scene that uh, is described here in these later chapters, 40? 41. Two guys will be out in the field. They'll be going about their business. Or in the story of, of Noah. Or in the story of Lot. People were going on as normal. They were living normal lives. They were marrying. They were given in marriage. Does that sound like verses uh, 20, 21 and 22? For then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world to now. And never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. Uh, the scripture, other passages describing this time, this future time, say that the earth will wobble like a drunk person. The earth is wobbling on its axis. There is so much destruction going on, so much uh, volcano activity, so much earthquake things going on. I referred to uh, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey report in an earlier message that showed a chart of uh, earthquakes uh, 5.0 and greater. It, it goes back several decades and, and the chart goes like this. In about 1980 it starts like this. Or, or maybe 60. And then in 80 it starts going up real steep. And today it's going up like this. Earthquakes 5.0 and above are commonplace. Commonplace today. We're used to it. We turn on the TV, oh, they had a, a 6.0 or a 7.5 over in such and such a place. We're used to it. We're, begin, we're coming hardened to it. We're not seeing them, this incredible increase in frequency and intensity. We're not seeing it as signs. We're seeing it, oh. We're used to it. In the days of Noah, people were going on with a regular life. In the days just prior to the Lord's return, there's nobody going through a regular life with the uh, earthquakes, with the uh, wobbling of the planet, with Christ saying, if I didn't come back, there wouldn't be life left on this planet. If I didn't shorten those days, there wouldn't be life left on this planet. So what I'm saying is, what I'm getting at, uh, the passage in verses 21 through uh, 20, 21, 22, that section, it's talking about the Lord physically returning to earth at the end of time. The passage that's talking about, there'll be one in the field, there'll be one grinding uh, in the mill. Uh, those are referring to Christ coming to deliver believers from the uh, in judgment that will come. Those left are left to endure it. Where's the grace? I titled this message, God's Incredible Grace. Let's see some grace. One, I see grace in the rapture of the church. God removing believers from the effects of the judgments. We don't deserve, by the way, we don't deserve to be kept from this time of intense trial, which is going to come on the whole earth. We don't deserve it at all. But the scripture says that believer in Christ, the believer in Christ has not been appointed to wrath but to ob obtaining grace. 
Another place I see God's incredible grace is during this horrible period of tribulation that uh, Christ references, but he doesn't describe it. There are other, doesn't describe it much. There are other passages, and we never have looked at those, and we're not going to in this message, in the Old Testament and the New, that describe horrors, just literally horrors, that will be going on on the earth at this time. I see grace during this great tribulation. Let's consider briefly the tribulation. It starts bad. It quickly gets worse with judgment upon judgment coming upon those who didn't think Christ worth knowing during this present age of grace. They didn't think Christ worth knowing. Christ comes. He removes his people from the planet. This is called rapture. The book of Revelation tells us, it describes all kinds of judgments that are coming upon the people of the earth after the church is removed. And it says, uh, in several places. It, it would tell about a judgment that was coming and then, it, and then it would say, and they still did not repent. And they still did not repent. What does that tell you? Brothers and sisters, it tells us that the purpose of these judgments for many people is a gracious one. It's to push them into repentance to save their eternal souls. So, many, we just read, did not repent. Still, they did not repent. But there's another story coming out of the Great Tribulation that is perhaps not as well known as all the fire and brimstone stuff. All those fire and brimstone judgments. But, they dem but it demonstrates God's grace. And that is, well, we're going to read Revelation 7, 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and there was before me a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I, this is John, the writer of Revelation, answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them, Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. This people, who before Christ came for his church, this people who didn't think God was worth knowing and following during their lives in this age of grace. When the judgment starts to fall, they turn to God. And God saves these people who didn't think he was worth knowing, who didn't think he was worth following. Now, during the tribulation, we're not going to get into these verses, but 
there is tremendous persecution of believers. When you become a believer during the tribulation, you're almost certainly going to die for it. Let's look again at verse 9 we just read. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne. A great multitude that no one could number. You know, this, uh, the book of Revelation, the same book that this is in, didn't have a problem numbering the armies from the east that were going to be involved in this uh, battle of Armageddon. Put a number on it, 200 million. That's a pretty high number. This is a higher number because this is a bigger number than, than you can count. What incredible grace. What incredible grace. We look at the tribulation, we look at these end times, and we focus on, on the judgments, on the fire, the brimstone. And God is focused. He is focusing these judgments on the people of earth to shake them, to turn them, to cause them to come to him and accept his grace, which he is still extending. It's costing them their lives. They become martyrs because we know that because we read that when uh, Christ does come to the earth physically, right after this period, right after the tribulation period. When he separates those that are going into the kingdom from those that are, that are going uh, to a place of torment, there, the population that goes into the kingdom, the scripture says, is very small. But mankind is reduced to a very small, uh, I would maybe just a few millions for the whole planet. I don't know. But it says, it says that uh, mankind will be rarer than gold from the field of Orpher. One gold field. That's how rare man is going to be on the face of the earth. How many, how come so unbelievably many people turn to Christ during this terrible time? I don't know about you, but I've, when I feel powerless or afraid, I seek the comfort of my Heavenly Father. And so will these folks. And to die a martyr's death in the arms of Christ will be wonderful. Remember right after 9-11 when the terrorists uh, took down the uh, World Trade Centers? Our financial district is in ashes. You remember seeing the pictures of all our politicians who today are taking away our religious liberties to worship Christ uh, uh, in certain public settings? Remember what those people were doing that day? They were standing on the steps of the Capitol. They were praying. And they were singing, God bless America. This is what tribulation does. We turn to God. The tribulation is a horrible time. It's a time of God's wrath. But the purpose is a gracious one. There'll be such a harvest of souls during this period of time. Trouble nudges us toward God. Right, let's read 42, Matthew 24. We're going to read uh, 42 then to the end probably. Therefore, keep watch, 
You do not know on what day your Lord will come. Understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch, would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. He then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does, is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces, assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do not be the person who lives like Christ isn't coming back to judge. Do not be the person who's living like Christ isn't coming back to judge. Be the person who looks at the time that he's living in, looks at the signs, and is looking forward and expectant that Christ is coming. We're going to be with him soon. What do I want us to take out of this message? Well, if you are a believer looking at the signs, if you are a believer looking at the signs will have a purifying effect on your life. The scripture says that. As you see his great day approaching, your priorities will change to be more like his. My priorities will change to be more like his if I am looking to his return. My boss is coming. I want to please him. If you are not a believer at this time, let me remind you that when we started this series, when I started this series, I, I started it by reading chapters, chapter 23, verses 37, 38, and 39. I'm going to read that again. Chapter 23, verses 37, 38, and 39. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, this is Christ talking. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The uh, parallel passage in, uh, to this in Luke, I believe it's Luke, tells us that as Jesus is saying these words, he's weeping. Weeping. How often I wanted to gather you, but you would not. Jesus is a prophet. He knows what's coming on upon Jerusalem in the very near future. In fact, uh, maybe 30, 35 years after this, Jerusalem is totally destroyed. There's a tremendous slaughter of the Jewish inhabitants of Jerusalem. It breaks his heart. And as I mentioned, the parallel passage in Luke mentions that Christ is weeping as he is saying this. If you have not surrendered your life to Christ yet, he, Christ, knowing what is coming, is pleading for you. He's pleading for you to be saved. He knows what will happen to you if you die unrepentant. He's weeping. He knows what will happen to you if you miss the rapture and you enter that awful time called the Great Tribulation. He knows the suffering that will happen to you. God, the great creator God, sustainer of this whole universe, 
He's pleading for you to come to him. Let me read uh, a verse that uh, Rachel taught the kids over at uh, Oak Hill Christian School when we were teaching music there. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20. 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are therefore, we, believers, are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Christ cannot be here physically today. He is here spiritually. He is, cannot be here physically imploring you, but he has made the believers ambassadors it is our job to implore you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. In another place, God says, today, and I'm speaking now to those who haven't yet accepted Christ as Savior. In another place, he says, today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. Don't resist me. He doesn't want to see you either to die uh, unregenerate or to go into the tribulation and go through all of that to come to him. He says in another place, my spirit will not always strive with the spirit of man. If Christ's spirit is tugging at you right now to accept this message of grace, His offer of salvation, please, please don't resist him. Surrender to love. Surrender to God's incredible grace. He doesn't want you to go through judgment. He doesn't want you to go through tribulation. So if you want to accept Christ today to be born again, talk to us today. Talk to someone. Talk to Pastor Dan. Talk to myself. Talk to any number of people in this church who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Get it done. We implore you. If you feel Christ tugging at your heart, don't resist him. Don't harden your heart against him. Just come. Get it done. The days are drawing to a close. The time for repentance is now. Uh, don't go through something you don't need to. Come. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.